Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Grasp and Robotics series. As a quick reminder, this and previously recorded talks can be found on our YouTube channel and website. Also, throughout the talk, please use the um, Q&A button to submit any questions. These will be answered at the end of, uh, the, end of the talk during the Q&A panel. Now, I'd like to introduce our GRASS faculty host for today's talk, Dr. Pratik, Chah Dr. Pratik Chahari, Assistant Professor of the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department within the School of Engineering here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much and enjoy the talk. Thank you, uh, Gabby and Mark. Uh, welcome to the GRASP seminar series, everyone. Uh, I'm Pratik. Uh, I would, mm, I'm very glad to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Laval. He's a professor of computer science uh, and robotics and virtual reality in particular at the University of Ulu in Finland. Uh, he was at uh, the um, Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois for many years from 2001 to 2018. And uh, most of us have read his work in some form or the other. He has worked on a large number of problems range, ranging from robotics, control, computational geometry. Uh, almost all students at GRASS in particular would have read his paper on, with James Kuffner on rapidly exploding random trees, uh, a very uh, popular motion planning algorithm. Uh, in his second stint, uh, he worked on virtual reality and sensor fusion as a co-founder and chief scientist at Oculus uh, before it was acquired by Facebook, which again, many of you may have played with. Uh, and he developed a tracking technology. And uh, in, in the last five, 10 years, uh, Steve has been working with perceptual psychologists uh, uh, on calibration of these devices, safety and health of these devices, how to make user experiences nice. So if uh, uh, you were very excited about VR uh, and began to love it sometime around 2016, 2017. Uh, you have Steve to thank for it. Uh, his textbook uh, on planning algorithms, uh, many of you have used it in your courses. It's kind of the second Bible of robotics next to Sebastian Thrun's book. Uh, there's a new book uh, uh, for those uh, who may not have seen it on virtual reality, which I personally am looking forward to reading a lot. But uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for joining us uh, very late on a Friday night, uh, all the way from Europe. Uh, looking forward to your talk. I'll let you take it from here. OK, thank you very much, Pratik. I'm very happy to be here. And um, uh, thanks, uh, everyone at Penn, for, uh, for, for taking the time to come to my talk. Um, and um, you know, certainly appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I have very uh, warm feelings towards Penn. I remember um, our collaborations went all the way back when I was a uh, postdoc in Jean-Claude Latome's group in the mid-1990s, and I came and visited Regina uh, and, and and friends uh, and collaborators um, um, a few times in the context of a, of a project that we had, and I really enjoyed the, 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 the culture, the strong scientific culture, appreciation of both mathematical foundations and algorithms, and of course, heavy experimentation at the same time, and it all kind of came together in a nice way. So, so I always appreciated the, um, uh, the culture there, and so, so it's nice. Um, I wish I could completely visit. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's ever heard, um, um, sort of been familiar with this kind of really boring metric space where the distance between every pair of points is exactly one. Um, that's kind of how it feels now. We're all like exactly the same distance apart. I could be down the street from you, but I'm all the way over in Finland and it's still kind of the same. So all this structure of the, the beautiful sort of earth and all of its complexity seems to have been kind of boiled down to these distance one Zoom meetings. So, um, so that's a bummer, but, 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 um, but anyway, I'm happy to, to be able to join you at this distance. So um, let me start on my slides here. <clears throat> if I can figure that out, I think I can. Um, let them share. Um, I'll share my desktop so I can throw some videos in as well. Okay. Um, I, I gave a, a little bit of an obnoxious title just to try to, to draw some audience, hopefully not annoying people too much. I know that uh, the, contr the control people are very strong in, um, in, in Penn um, throughout the years and, and decades. Um, so I will talk about billiard-like robots. I, I won't be talking about virtual reality today. I talked about that last time I came there, which was um, maybe around 2014 or so, right after Oculus. And I, maybe nobody remembers what I talked about then, but I thought it would be really fun to, to continue my, my passion in, in robotics. And, um, and I've been spending a lot of time mixing robotics and virtual reality um, while at the University of Oulu. So, so I can't really, I, I really still feel like robotics is my natural home community. Um, work I've talked about has been done for over a decade. 
um, some of it even beginning at near the end of the DARPA Stomp project, with um, which my Penn colleagues were, were very heavily involved in as well. Uh, Dan Kodacek, Vijay Kumar, and Rob Grice, who went from UIUC to Penn during the project even as well. So um, we're involved in that. Um, and uh, my, one of my most recent graduates, my last PhD student to finish UIUC, Ali Nillis, who just finished her PhD a couple of months ago, contributed to some of the more recent work I'll talk about here. And she's currently a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell. So typical mobile robot design, develop some stable vehicle system, do SLAM, construct geometric map of the environment, maybe plan some collision-free paths for the vehicles, um, provide some kind of state estimation system, deploy feedback control laws, track some target trajectories. If you have multiple robots, you have your communication and coordination issues, all, all fine and good. Um, maybe you might wanna consider with, with swarm robots, uh, which have been around for well over a decade or more, um, the robots sense each other. There's motion control with respect to neighboring robots, different ways they may maneuver together and such. Maybe the control becomes more distributed um, and, um, and they, they may even themselves become landmarks in some way. So many works on that, just a piece from James McClurkin here, which I always liked from, from years back. Um, my kind of simple robot that, that I wanna talk about today, or at least provide some inspiration is um, runs like this. I'll speed it up a little bit. At least you used to be able to do that in the 90s. Um, people still speeding up robot videos. So I have this ball-like sort of robot and its job is to just go explore around wildly, trying to see if there's any way to escape, let's say. So maybe it's an exploration robot. So um, what was that robot? Well, I gave it no map in advance. I had no position estimation available on the system. Um, there's no system identification performed, so I don't know what even the system was dynamically, precisely. Um, there's some people around who could try to figure it out, but it's, 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 let's just say it's not easy. There's wheel slippage or spherical ball slippage and all kinds of things going on. Um, there's actually no sensors inside or outside of the robot. Um, there's actually no computer, no digital devices of any kind, just one motor, and it's off-centered a bit and oscillates at about two hertz. So it's just this toy called a weasel ball, and it costs about $4. Um, at least last time I was buying some in the US, it did. Maybe if you're on the streets of Shenzhen in China, maybe it's less than a dollar. So, so just some simple motor spinning, but it does some pretty interesting behaviors, even though um, it, it doesn't seem to have much inside. In fact, okay, maybe it's a bit crazy for me to even call it a robot, but I wanted you to think of it that way and then, and then realize, okay, it's, it's doing something interesting. How can we maybe exploit that by kind of helping it out a little bit and carrying it further? Before I get back to experimental things, I just want to mention a bit of theory. So I spent a lot of time working on robot motion planning, of course, and um, you know that involves trying to move in a way that avoids the obstacles. So what if instead you just hit obstacles and try to uh, make some kind of bouncing rules or interaction rules between the boundaries? So, so we hit the boundary or obstacles and we want to have simple laws of how you should interact with that. Maybe you don't actually hit the boundary in practice. Maybe you just get really close and then there's a kind of maneuver that happens and then a, and then a motion away from the boundary occurs. So I'll, I'll be saying it bounces, but it doesn't have to physically bounce. It can be a kind of virtual or almost bounce. That's also fine. So for bouncing, we move along a straight line when we're in the interior until the boundaries hit. And then we have some angle theta coming in and some angle theta prime coming out. And oh, I think my little pointer even works. And, and I have this, this angle coming out and I wanna to try to figure out what the state of prime maybe ought to be for some kind of nice behavior I would like. Um, so we could make nice fixed bouncing rules. Like I could say, well, the, the outgoing angle should be exactly um, the, the incoming angle or the way I've made it is 180 minus that or pi minus that. So, um, so it could be a simple reflection law. Maybe I could always come out by just turning 90 degrees, whichever way left or right I'm allowed to go. Um, you'll only be allowed to go one of those two directions. Or maybe you ignore the direction you came in and you just move away at the normal. So these would be three very simple po uh, possibilities for these bouncing rules. Uh, more generally, I want to think about some very simple sensing systems where um, I build an information space as I talk about in chapter 11 of my planning algorithms book, but it shows up in many other places where you have any kind of sensor fusion and filtering and such. So I have some kind of information I've gathered that's maybe you know, small amount perhaps. I really like minimalism a lot. And then um, we try to choose the exit angle, um, calling it U here as an action or input um, to the system 
um, the action that's being chosen by the robot. And um, um, we, we base that on information states. So it, it could be something really simple, like just how many times have I bounced so far? Like maybe if you've bounced an odd number of times, you do the reflection law. And if you've bounced an even number of times so far, you do the right angle. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but that would be one example. Or you have simple, maybe estimates of your heading or position in some kind of crude way. And maybe you want to use that. And I'll give some examples of this as we go along. Um, I want to talk, I said a bit of theory. It, it's more of the theory that provides the inspiration for the work that I'll talk about that's experimental. And I would say the two haven't fully converged yet, but, but, um, but I hope they're on some kind of collision course that uh, maybe I or others can eventually kind of, kind of merge in some nice way. But I was, I was very inspired learning about these kind of iterated map descriptions of dynamical systems. Uh, mostly growing up in electrical engineering, I, I learned about dynamical systems from expressions that are differential equations. We, we all like x dot equals f of x u in, in control. So there's some you know, differentiable manifold, blah, 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 blah. Off you go defining your control system. But um, I really like this Poincare map way of, of expressing systems. You have some um, Poincare section. Suppose here we're talking about planetary orbits. Um, so planets go round and round. And I have some um, orthogonal sheet. And I want to look at where the planet hits each time. And I just want to consider one uh, the mapping that goes from hitting the sheet to hitting the sheet again. So, so you can imagine the system in its description has been pre-integrated. So I didn't have to start with differential equations. They're hiding under the cover somewhere, but I just worry about these iterated maps. And I want to ask the question, each time I keep applying this map F, which is a transition map, where does, the, where does, the, um, where does it keep poking at this Poincaré section? It keeps going boing, 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 hitting it in different places. What does that look like? Does it eventually hit everywhere? Does every open set get touched within some, some, some you know, well-defined region or predefined region? Or does it miss some spots? Does it eventually come back? Is it periodic? Or does it just kind of run around forever and never actually loop back to the, to, the, to the same starting place again? So these are the kinds of questions mathematicians were asking going into the late 19th century and, and it continued across the 20th century. Um, eventually there's this billiard version of it, which reminds me of these bouncing robots where you imagine something like, this is called the Bunimovic Stadium where you hit a hockey puck and it never stops moving. And it just uses this nice uh, reflection law. Uh, people started studying dynamical billiards largely because you get, let's say a, a boundary case Hamiltonian system for that. So you end up with volume preserving or measure preserving flows, which is the, one of the key characteristics of a Hamiltonian system. And this allows um, people to take a lot of the, the, the techniques mathematical machinery from Hamiltonian mechanics and bring them over to these billiard analysis problems. And a, a number of um, you know, mathematicians after Poincaré have studied that, especially in uh, Russian mathematics. Um, Sinai um, um, studied quite a bit of these. Uh, Sinai was a student of Kolmogorov. Bunimovich was a student of Sinai. Um, last I checked, um, um, Bunimovich was at uh, Georgia Tech as a mathematician there, uh, for example. Um, Sinai in the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, it's a Sinai billiard. So there's entire papers and studies on just particular structures and trying to figure out what happens when you have this um, um, infinitely long bounce or what happens uh, asymptotically. What kind of characteristics do you get? Um, in particular, people are studying um, ergodic dynamics and these can be described in a very general way. I, I tend to like viewing it at the level of um, measure theory that's not necessarily tied to probabilities and statistics. So some of you maybe have studied ergodicity in the context of statistics, but it, it lives in a very general way. And I kind of like it in the general way because um, there's something very, I think, non-probabilistic and nice about it as well, or let's say not necessarily probabilistic and, and nice about it. Um, and, and so just to give a little bit of definitions here to kind of play around a bit, but I'm, I'm not gonna use this too much, but I just want to give you a flavor of it. So in this case, we have some uh, state space or, or set X, and um, we, we put a sigma algebra over it because we're gonna talk about some, some kind of measure on it, but We'll just use normal Lebesgue measure anyway for the kind of things that I care about, but this is a very general setting. And um, then we have step four here, this um, map that's going to be iterated. And we say that it preserves measure if um, for any set that we have in our nice sigma algebra, the ones that we can measure, then um, the pre-image of set A, um, so F minus one, is just, it just looks like an inverse, but it's the pre-image of the set A. So the measure of the pre-image is equal to the measure of A. Um, you, you might like me to say the measure of f of a is equal to the measure of a. That's reasonable. It works for some cases, but using the inverse is more general. It handles some, some more cases. So that's just a, an annoying technicality. So it's, 
if you want to erase the inverse and, and just say f of a equals measure of a it works most of the time that's an okay intuition but it's better to have it um, measure of the the uh, pre-image of a and so um, a measurable set is called f invariant mod zero if we look at the the measure of this symmetric difference so i'm looking at a the original set and i'm looking at the set that i came from using this uh, pre-image and then i'm looking at the symmetric difference i'm seeing what sort of leaks out okay and the, the, the function f is, is called ergodic if every one of these f invariant mod zero sets uh, measurable sets we have either um, the measure of that set a is equal to the whole state space x so the whole set x or the measure is zero so either um, you're really looking at modulo measure zero. You know, we're always trying to throwing out measure zero things happens and I don't know, all over the place, right? You've seen it enough times in robotics, but um, either, you know, you're starting with the entire set except for measure zero and there's kind of nowhere to grow from or leave from by applying F over and over and over again, or um, you, you have a set of measure zero and there's some sort of special cases there, right? So for all other cases, what it means is that um, if you take sort of a, an ordinary set A, ordinary measurable set A, it means that the system cannot be trapped in there. You apply F and it jumps somewhere else. The symmetric difference does not have a uh, measure zero. So it's like not trappable. That's my intuition. Um, so, so a system is ergodic if you can't find a, a region uh, A that, uh, that traps it. So here's a very simple example of this kind of you know, very, very basic definitions. My state space could be the circle S1, and then I just do a planar rotation by some angle theta, and um, my set A doesn't have to be um, connected. I didn't say anything about that, so it's these four disjoint blue intervals. And then I can look at two cases. In one case, I have theta equals pi over 2, and if it's pi over 2, then, um, then um, what happens with the rotations is it's just I just keep applying F, and I just keep rotating 90 degrees, rotating 90 degrees, and it comes back to a cycle. So that's not ergodic dynamics. But if I take theta equals three halves, that's not rationally related to two pi. And so um, if we do a, th a three halves transformation, keep applying a rotation of exactly three halves radians, right? No pi's in there. Then it'll keep going around and making some sort of crazy pattern, but it ends up having ergodic dynamics. So there's no sort of set you can trap it. And this blue set doesn't trap it. And, and there's, there's no way to trap it. You will always escape this set and every other set unless the set has the same measure as two pi or has measure zero. So that's kind of the idea. And one of the questions people ask is if I just keep, if I look at the time average by iterating these maps over and over and over again, and I take the limit as n goes to infinity and I look at all the places we visited, think of that Poincare section and, and striking the surface over and over again. You wanna, what, what, what people want to know is um, in the limit when I hit all those, those points over and over and over again, does it end up converging to being whatever the measure of the space is? Do I end up with the time average and the space average looking the same? And um, famous uh, theorem by Birkhoff um, says that these are the same, in fact, almost everywhere. And so um, what that ends up saying is that for these billiard problems, if you establish that the trajectories are ergodic, then the frequency of visits to some particular region is proportional only to the measure of that region under Lebesgue measures. So, so it's very nice. It means that it doesn't really matter what the shape of that region is or where it's at, you're gonna hit it um, um, in, in a strongly kind of uniform often way, let's say, that really just is based on the size of the region. So that's very nice. Um, there's really this amazing result, which is that for almost all polygons and almost all initial conditions, the trajectory that you get is ergodic. And this almost all is not exactly with measure zero exceptions. It's based on meager sets. So it's a little bit you know, significantly weirder, I would say, than what you're accustomed to. But let me nevertheless just show you some simple little Python code that I hacked up. So, um, so there's some billiard bouncing around in some simple polygon. Um, this is the simple polygon from a computational geometer's perspective. So it's got a ridiculous number of edges. Simple polygon in control theory is probably like a square or something, but it, which is, there's reasons why they would like to do it that way. But this is a sort of wild one. So you know, if we wait long enough, it'll asymptotically run around, and it will visit everything infinitely often and in kind of a nice uniform way, asymptotically. I'm not going to sit and wait for that to happen. We'll just we'll just continue on with. It. So um, so it, it doesn't take much. Just using again, this is just using the standard uh, bounce law. That's the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So so just like a mirror reflection. So this would be the same as a what would happen to a laser in a hall of mirrors. So that's Pretty amazing, actually. So you can get really good coverage 
with very little effort. And you don't even have to do anything random. You know, okay, we know we can do random walks and kind of get around everywhere too in some kind of nice way. But um, but that's but that's not what we're getting here. Um, all right. So that's fine. But what's what's different about our robotics problems than the, some of these these fancy mathematical works that I've shown? Well, actually, I don't care about measure preserving maps, so I, I don't need to study Hamiltonian systems. Someone can make a pretty good living in robotics doing that. But um, but but for the kind of things I want to design, I don't need that. And um, I can also make all kinds of different bouncing laws that are, I think, pretty easily implementable with very simple um, robot systems, very simple mechanical system, maybe very simple sensors, maybe almost no sensors. Um, and so and so that's not bad. And ergodicity is, you know, a nice condition to have. But um, we may just want basic reachability. We might not need it to be quite that strong. So, so a lot of questions I have. And when I show that to mathematicians, sometimes they work on these um, um, problems that involve uh, dynamical billiards. They're like, wow, you can do something non-Hamiltonian? Are you sure? I mean, already the Hamiltonian problem is kind of a borderline case, almost like a toy problem. And I'm like, well, yeah, I think you, I think you can. You can get away with this. These are easily implementable. And I think they're worth studying. Um, so there's all kinds of other things you can do. Um, like a non-measure preserving map is this famous uh, Bernoulli map where in the unit interval mod one, you just take a point like 0 0.37298 and just double it, but it's mod one. So you keep doubling and doubling and doubling. And that has some very nice properties, but it's not a um, Hamiltonian uh, system. And, and it, it may be even better than, it has some really nice mixing properties that, that, are, that are perhaps better, um, but, um, but it's, it's ergodic and, and um, not necessarily measure preserving. So I, I, I kind of, maybe it's a little bit in, informal perhaps, but I, I call it wildness, maybe weaker than ergodic. I just want topological transitivity, which basically means for any set, some subset C of the state space, um, I wanna look at the trajectory. And what I would like is to have it um, so that every open subset of my set C is visited infinitely often, or let's say it gets visited in a finite amount of time. Um, and what subsets I pick? Well, maybe it could be the whole state space, but it might also just be the boundary. Um, of, of say the polygon, for example. I may want so that every interval along the boundary, every open interval gets visited. So no open set gets left behind, right? It, it's a, you pick your favorite open set and it gets visited no matter how tiny it is. Um, maybe I also have this like cross zero pi here because I wanna look at um, particular angles as well and make sure that, um, that, that I get a, a dense covering of those as well. So it's a little weaker than, than ergodicity. How much weaker depends on the context. Some, in some contexts, they may actually be equivalent, but, but it really depends. Um, we spent some time studying the, the, the properties of different transition laws and, um, and um, inside of particular polygons. For example, if we just have a fixed rule that with respect to the, the, the boundary normal, we, 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 we bounce at an angle that's less than pi over two, um, it, it's plus or minus because it depends on which direction you're coming from. So, so it's a little bit off from the normal. Then it turns out that you, you get natural repellers from corners whenever the interior angle is less than some amount, certainly less than 90 degrees or much less than that. Um, and um, I started thinking about this from a dynamical systems kind of perspective. We like to think about repellers and attractors, right? So, so vertices become a repeller under this kind of fixed uh, normal based bounce rule. And you can even get attractors in some interesting way where um, if you have these kind of bouncing rules, um, you can be out bouncing around, but as soon as you go past the, um, the green line bouncing around, I'm sorry, I don't have an animation for it, but when you get inside the, to the right of the green line, then um, it's like a point of no return, uh, like the event horizon of a black hole, you get sucked into this basin of attraction and you can't ever get out from the purple line here. So we can, it's not too hard to show that, or whether in simulation or on paper, because it's just some sort of simple geometry. So I thought that was pretty neat that under these different bouncing laws, the kind that the mathematicians don't care about because um, they're not necessarily Hamiltonian ones. Okay, they've done some work on non-Hamiltonian ones, but, but, but by and large, they, they, they steer clear of most of them. Um, and we even get weird stuff that for some one, one particular kind of system getting, getting a very close to normal, um, if we place the robot in there and let it start bouncing around, um, from any starting point, it will end up in this bottom triangle. So there end up being sort of natural flows sometimes just based on um, selecting particular bouncing laws. If we do a, a, a right angle bouncing rule, like we force the robot to always bounce 90 degrees with respect to the angle it came in, now we ignore the normal and we do a fixed angle 
bouncing law, then the corners become attractors instead of repellers. So these are some things we, we looked at in some, in some works we did. Uh, in more recent work, which is coming out soon in IGRR, but it was also covered in WAFER a couple of years back, mainly the work of, of my student, Alexandra Nillis, um, is um, to, to do, let's say, computational geometry kinds of computations, which uh, to me has been really wonderful because um, I love computational geometry. I love uh, control and dynamical systems. It's really hard to mix the two, but this ends up being a natural kind of playground for mixing the two because um, visibility computations, um, even going all the way back to this collaboration we had with Penn back in the, in the 90s, I got interested in visibility um, calculations back then and started learning computational geometry at that time from Leo Gibas and others. And, and so um, um, th th that way of thinking is, is very nice here. So what you want to do is try to calculate uh, reachable sets, just like you would do in a dynamical system. Maybe not so bad for linear systems. And of course, it's really bad for general nonlinear systems. This is some kind of weird system. It's simple in some ways, but complicated in others. The complexity is mainly due to the complicated polygonal environment. So, um, so we have some visibility-based algorithms that, 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 um, that we develop here. And um, basically, you go around to each vertex, and you, um, um, for each uh, feature that, let's say, every other vertex that you can see, you extend a kind of visibility line segment in both directions, um, both towards the vertex and, and then backwards to the wall. Because what you want to do is you want to um, think about the way the visibility changes in some combinatorial way as you move along the boundary here. Because these boundaries are going to be different places where the robot's going to hit. And then you want to study the outgoing flows and try to characterize those in a finite but exact way. So we developed some algorithms for doing that. This just kind of shows a little bit of what the representation looks like. So when you're sitting on each one of these sort of intervals, um, the, the, the combinatorial description is identical, say between zero and one, and then it changes at one, and then it's the same between one and two, and then it changes when you get to two to three. And, and then you can make a kind of transition graph that expresses what these uh, forward projections or flows, well, it's, it's, it's a flow, but it's a, over, over a family of bouncing angles. So you're actually studying, um, it, it, looks, it looks very much like doing, looking at reachable sets for a control system, something you might do for uh, verification, let's say. So it looks very similar, but you're actually considering different bouncing laws. Um, we also had some additional uh, uh, small results that we were studying here, like um, um, conditions f um, under which some fixed balancing rule forms a contraction mapping. And then you could use that to reduce uncertainty if you're not quite certain what angle you're going to bounce at. So there's some other things you could check out there. Um, I'm worried I'm going to run out of time, so I will go a little bit further here. So, so that's some sort of <clears throat> Um, sort of theoretically oriented work that we're trying to do. Then we did some experimental work. Most of this was done uh, before I left University of Illinois for, for Oculus. Um, and um, we, we wanted to have this idea of robots doing these wild systems kind of things. So we assume that for a system, it's fairly difficult to predict what it's going to do. Sensing is limited um, or unavailable. Even we were, we were maybe lazy or, or, or too difficult to do dynamical system modeling or identification. And um, you know, we, we know though that the system is wild in some sense, so it will try to break out of any cage we put it into um, in some nice way. Remember this, no open set left behind. So, so we want the, the boundary to be poked at from, from, from every possible place. <clears throat> um, and I, I think this is reasonable in something like a micro nano robotics kind of setting, you know, with people always um, maybe talk about medical applications or, or MEMS, uh, you know, kinds of settings. Well, um, you may have MEMS and NEMS architectures and things that you're using in different kinds of settings, whether it's, um, I don't want to know if I want to claim to go so far as like putting robots into the bloodstream or something, but you can certainly imagine small robots in fluids or, or working in very small areas and such. And you can't load them with a lot of sensing and, and predictability becomes difficult, controllability becomes hard. So, so why not? Um, I started thinking about how to manipulate robots that are wild and I, I was sitting once in the, in the breakfast area um, in, in the US here at, at one of these kind of hurry up and eat your breakfast before it closes. And I was sitting there and at 930, um, the, the, the host of the place went and locked the door so that nobody else could come in, but I could still finish. And I thought, wow, that was quite a gentle way to manipulate the humans into, into the ultimate plan here because eventually the humans get bored when the food runs out or they're done eating and they all go flowing through the door, but nobody else hopefully sneaks in. Um, so if you think about it, these things happen all over the place. There's turnstiles and doggy doors and bug traps and all sorts of things like this going on. 
um, to manipulate. I, I consider the humans to be kind of like wild bodies here. And it's kind of related to Maxwell's demon. I often get this. Uh, I remember uh, Noah Cohen from uh, Johns Hopkins would, would, would um, uh, showed me this and when, when I was talking about to him about this work many years ago. And, um, and um, in this case, you know, wouldn't it be nice to separate um, for some gas um, in, 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 you have two chambers A and B, wouldn't it be nice if you could get all the fast moving high energy molecules to uh, one side and the cold slow ones to the other side, if you could just make some material that just like lets them, lets the fast ones pass through in one way and the cold ones pass through in the other. If you could, that seems to violate the second law of thermodynamics. If you can make a little door that opens and closes just at the right time, that'd be fine, but you need some information to do that. That information will cost you energy and then you can kind of have the thermodynamics balance back out in this thing called the generalized Yudzinski inequality, um, if you like. So there's some ways to do that. And I guess we're kind of cheating like that too. We might make, okay, we're not doing gas dynamics kinds of things, but, um, but we, we, can, we can make the little door open and close in different kinds of ways using information states. So why not? So if you just divide the world into regions and gates, the gates are like the turnstiles, the regions are where these wild bodies will go um, kind of messing around. Then um, we, we, we make some wild bodies, we arrange the regions and gates in some way, and then we try to come up with, um, we formulate our tasks in terms of region sequences, and then we configure the gates in some way that make the things happen that we would like. So that's the general idea. Um, so what kind of gate transitions can we have? Well, we wanna go between two adjacent regions. So we can allow bi-directional passage, it just becomes like an open doorway, or we can allow passage from, um, from R to R prime only in one direction or the other, or we completely block it and allow nothing. So those are the possibilities if we have a gate between only two regions. Uh, we could have kind of multi-region gates too, which I'll get to in a bit. So what kind of gates? Well, we could have static gates. They have the same behavior all the time. We could have pliant gates where um, maybe the gate itself has an internal state, but it, it just complies with the mechanical system of the robot and gets itself into different configurations. Maybe the gate's controllable, I have a motor on it and I can control that. Now you start to wonder what's the robot and what's the, um, the environment. Okay, maybe when I have a controllable gate, I've started putting, you know, let's just say robot system and the gate that's controllable becomes part of the system as well. Maybe the weasel balls that are out moving around look less like a robot than the controllable gate at this point. So yeah, you, you kind of have to get a little more I guess liberal about what a robot is, or at least it makes for interesting philosophical discussions, which, which I find interesting enough, so why not? Um, I could also make the gates virtual in some sense. I could have the robots detect these gate-like things using their sensors, and they can bounce off of that as if it was, or, or go through it as if it were a real obstacle. So, so, so that's um, go through it if it's not, as if it were open, or bounce off of it as if it were closed. So you can make this idea virtualized as well. So here's how to make a static gate. We first just cut some pieces of paper and stuck them up against a brick. And then um, just like the doggy door, um, you, you can get a flow like that. So you can, you can make a discrete flow into some particular region that you like by just you know, running whatever breadth per search, any algorithm you like um, to just calculate the direction you ought to go. It's a kind of easy graph-based planning. Um, reminds me a lot of sequential compositions of, of funnels. Um, all kinds of things like navigation functions related to this as well, um, of, um, of a, a, a Kodachek and Ramon and all sorts of things like this. It, it all fits, fits very nicely. Um, so um, yeah, I guess this is one of our very first um, sort of silly experiments, um, a bit absurdist, but um, we just made these little paper. Um, you know, there's, there's four regions here, one, two, three, four. We want the, the robots balls to all go into the final region here. Is this even robotics or not? I don't know, you can, you know, maybe I'm, well, we can argue about that maybe during the discussion part of this. Um, I'll speed it up a bit. Eventually, I'm not saying I'm doing optimal stuff, but hey, if you give up on optimality, all kinds of fun things are possible. So, and hey, a lot of people make a good living proving asymptotic things, so. Um, okay, one of the robots actually sneaks back up here at the top, which is kind of funny. So just like humans might try to do, so sorry about that. They even noticed that <laughs> one of our students, uh, um, Katrina, noticed that Gossman. Um, yeah, so eventually it all gets there. Yay! So they all make it to the end. Um, so that's you know just very simple static gates. Um, 
and we eventually learned how to make better gates so that the balls don't go backwards. Um, you do the same thing with vibrating bugs. These little things that look like a toothbrush with a vibrator on top, toothbrush head with a vibrator on top. So we want them to go around to the white area. They're actually on little ledges and they fall. So I'm not, I'm cheating. I'm not showing you the, the height dimension. So that's why they can't go back. They just fall off the ledges. So we can manipulate them into doing things as well. I'll speed that up a bit. They'll even jump to the end. Eventually, you know, they all make their way there. Okay, one of them's really getting kind of stuck, but their friends help out and we can make them all go where we want them to go. So yay, we solved some, some multi-region, multi-robot swarm, blah, blah, task. Okay, but, but okay, it kind of in a, in a cheap, annoying way. Um, we could do like um, single body patrolling. We could have, or multi-body patrolling even just by arranging. It's a little bit sloppy here in the picture, but you can have this uh, ball go around in a, in a clockwise fashion, going region, 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 and visiting every region infinitely often or until the battery dies. Um, we could do, yeah, with one body or multiple bodies. Then we have these pliant gates where they have an internal configuration. And by, by allowing this called a mode, and uh, like the, the gate could, or in the left picture here, if the ball comes along, the ball can flow from left to right, but then, no, but, but then it moves to this configuration and then no more balls can go from left to right anymore. A ball would have to come from uh, right to left to, to move it back. So it's just like an L shape that moves 90 degrees. So that's a simple pliant gate. Um, oh, I even have one of these? No, I don't anymore, um, which, is, which is okay. I think, why is it, okay, I don't know. It's when my hand is ready to do something there, but I'm not sure what it's trying to do. Um, so so we, we did some implementation of that, but I, I don't have a video of that. We made a four-way one, almost looks more like a revolving door, but it can, it can do a 90 degree rotation, but it allows very sort of more complex interaction between the four regions around it. Um, we have controllable gates where I can put it in one of these four modes, block all passage, allow one way, the other way, or, um, or, or allow bi-directional passage. So we have these different modes and then we can think about what information we use. Like maybe they're just timed. After a certain amount of time, we change the mode. Or um, maybe we have uh, some sensor feedback that's being used, some simple output feedback. Like maybe in some case we had a little uh, um, uh, um, emitter uh, detector pair and like, like with, a, with a laser and a, and a, and a photodiode, let's say. And uh, when, when, the, when, the, when the robot or ball goes over it, um, you can use sensor feedback to turn off that gate or, 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 or update a counter if you want. But in this case, it just was direct sensor feedback. Any other kind of general information states we can allow. So we're, we're, we're okay with doing that sort of thing. Um, all right. Um, so we did this with a tilting ramp, just a piece of plexiglass and a motor. And uh, oh yeah, this is exactly the, the laser case. And uh, the ball comes up to it and we get some sensor data that, oh, the ball's crossed it and we might wanna change the configuration of the tilting ramp. So that would be a way to achieve this in a pretty simple way. You can replace the weasel ball with any other thing. I don't, it doesn't really matter. Like I said, you have vibrating bugs and there's a lot of other possible robots and things you could build for that. But we, we found the, the ball is quite robust. So um, we went a little further and we thought, okay, what other task can we solve? Well, we could express the task in maybe some more fancy logic and then, uh, convert it into some solution that's described in terms of region sequences, possibly infinite, and then implement it with these controller gates. So one of the things we did, we, we took some works uh, borrowing from um, um, our friends at Penn actually back in 2005, um, doing motion planning with linear temporal logic to express different kinds of tasks like simple navigation. Okay, we know how to do that, but maybe there's a sequencing like this regions need to be visited in some order. Um, the diamond means eventually, and the, uh, the square means always, uh, the fancy U is until. So you can avoid regions, you can say not any of these regions until the final ones reach. So different kinds of conditions um, can be made. And uh, you can use your favorite, uh, let's say model checker. Um, if you're lucky, it finishes running because the complexity can get very high for one of these things. And then you get some description of an infinite region sequence. And then we can feed that into our simple um, um, system and get the weasel balls to do exactly what, it, what, what we specified with LTL. So it's a very, very simple, low budget way to, um, to get LTL based tasks um, to be achieved by the robots, assuming you ignore the complexity of this NUSMV thing going on. We started to get interested in controlling the distributions of bodies. So, or, or any kind of balls or bodies or whatever that, that were put in the environment. 
So how many do we have in each region? Like as if they were a bunch of indistinguishable balls in boxes, like the combinatorics people like. Is it balls and urns or balls and boxes? It depends on how old you are maybe, but, but um, anyway, there's these combinatorics problems like that. And so there's a natural kind of transition graph to study. We did a lot of um, kind of Markov process kinds of studies of these things with many, many balls, both in simulation and then with some theory, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip over that. I don't wanna cover that in, in, in much um, detail. Um, this is one, one maybe nice experiment that we did where you have um, four, different regions and a bunch of balls. Maybe there was about 50 or so. And then we have these gates. They're, they're, they're labeled with arrows going left or going right. And um, you, you can see the directions so that they, they enter or, or, or go in. And based on the size of the region and the thickness of the gate, the overall total thickness of the gate, we could predict what distribution of balls would happen using our theory would, would result asymptotically. And we confirmed experimentally that it seems to happen like that, okay? We didn't do an infinite number of experiments with an infinite number of balls or anything even remotely looking like that. But, um, <clears throat> but it, did, it did work out so that um, going clockwise from the, the top left, we should get, let's say, um, twice as many balls as we, on the left as we do in this top region in the center. And we get the same amount on the two ends, but in this lower region, we get a very high density of balls, a very high, uh, um, number of balls, I think, ends up getting getting concentrated there. I think that's what should happen. I don't think it's density. I think it's number of balls, but I, I might forget. Um, so um, we actually shared this lab with some computer vision researchers who got very annoyed when we would do experiments like this because it was very loud. So um, so we, we still feel a bit apologetic about that. Too. But it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I'm really going to speed that one up. But I, after a while, they they end up in some nice distribution that we predicted. I'm gonna jump ahead. I don't, I don't wanna keep watching these forever, but they end up with... Yeah. It should be the distribution I said, doesn't it? But, and maybe this video, maybe there's a longer version of this that gets there, so. But um, that's sort of the idea, watching these things and confirming that they get to the distribution that they that they should. Um, oh, oh, I get it, yeah, okay. It's it's two, one, and then four on the right, and then two in the in the lower center one. I said it the wrong way, I mixed up the four and the two. I forgot that it's going around clockwise, so that's why it did, I think, look right in the end. Now let's convince, let's see if it, nothing to hide here, let's see if it does this. Yeah, I think it has, you can see a very large number of balls on the right, and then, um, a very small number of balls on the top, and these two here on the on the left on the on the lower center should be roughly the same. But um, okay, let's see here. We we started experimenting with virtual gates, so we built some simple um, robots with a just Arduino controller, getting a using a serb open source uh, robot design, which we hacked a little bit and added a bumper to it. So you know, kind of class project kind of kind of looking robot, and then. Um, we made a, um, uh, we put a simple sensor on it that could just tell us, um, like, let's say essentially one pixel, but just what color is the ground. And uh, if it's this gray like floor that we have, then the sensor reports one thing. If it's white or if it's red, it can report that. So it can detect the different colors. So this electrical tape that we put down on the floor in red or white becomes a virtual wall or virtual gate for us. And so we can tell the robot under some information states, you can cross it under some other information states you can't. And so, um, and so for example, we make a very simple information feedback plans where there's only two information states. And um, let's say an information state zero, uh, the whites are open and the reds are closed. And then in the other information state, white is closed and red is open. And then um, if you do that, you can make these kind of patrolling robots that just go back and forth. And um, they just keep jumping from region to region. Sometimes they get lucky and they just go straight and they're fine. You can see the blue one starts messing around and doing stupid stuff because it's still gonna be a wild body and it's gonna keep moving straight and then bouncing, doing a virtual bounce. Um, sorry, yeah, doing a virtual bounce. It doesn't actually, well, no, this one does contact, sorry. There's a bumper on it. It's a virtual bounce if it hits the tape and then it's an actual bounce if it hits the wall. Um, so it does a lot of inefficient, let's say stupid stuff, but eventually it crosses the white so it's forced to cross white, red, white, red, white, red, white, red, and they both keep doing this. So they're both doing this kind of patrolling and they're, they're fairly oblivious to each other as long as it doesn't interfere with their 
wild behavior inside of each region. All the blue really got lucky there, that last one. So that's the basic idea. Um, so I, I can make a very simple, what I call combinatorial filter. I did a lot of combinatorial filtering methods, especially in this DARPA stomp project we had that, as I said, Penn was a big part of. Um, and um, um, what I wanna keep track of here is um, whether or not two bodies that are moving around or robots, let's say, are in the same room. So in this environment, there's three rooms, uh, the top, the lower left and the lower right. And they're delineated by these A, B and Cs which are like the tape on the floor or like some kind of gates, let's say. And I can make a simple combinatorial filter, which uh, we worked out with uh, Fred Cohen from University of Rochester and Ben Hamin Bovar, who was my PhD student. Um, and um, this two-bit filter um, keeps track of whether or not the two bodies are together. T is the together state. They could be together in the top, left or right region, doesn't matter, they're together, they're together. That's all I distinguish in this information state. And then there's this DA means they're in different rooms, but A is the boundary between them. A is separating them. And DB is similar, but B is separating. And DC means they're in different rooms, but C is separating. And then every time a, 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 a green line is crossed by either body, we don't know which one, then um, a transition occurs in this diagram. And so if you do that, then you can make now um, some simple patrolling mechanism here um, where um, these two bodies have to keep separate, they have to stay in different rooms. So immediately they separate. And now we want them to patrol in a clockwise way using this very simple two-bit filter as feedback. So they can't ever go in the same room together. This one may be trying, but I don't know what the red one was doing there for a while. We built pretty cheap robots, you know, we're kind of having fun. Um, so you're supposed to do in robotics, right? We're all doing this for fun, I hope. So, um, so it just goes around and around in a clockwise order. Um, but again, keeping themselves separated. For what reason, I don't know, but I'm just showing that you can, you can implement this behavior if you want. Um, so they do some reasonable kind of patrolling, but they also make their rounds. And inside of each region, they're doing their wild behavior, but then um, they make pretty good rounds. So that's the idea for that one. And I unfortunately don't have the video for this one, but we, we started gluing you know, why not? We started gluing fins on them and we found some reasonable configurations where you could get them to go spinning along in a, in a, in a small fountain that we had at the University of Illinois by the engineering um, um, dean's office. And, um, and it went uh, kind of bouncing around and we kind of wondered if we could do all this in water, but eh, we never got too much further than that, but it was fun to think about. We also tried controlling live insects, but right away we noticed they were a little bit too smart. Um, we got all the crickets to kind of go the way we wanted, except for the last cricket who mysteriously seemed to look down at his friends and, and just stood there for a very, very long time and then started walking on the edges of our walls and didn't quite work too well. Eventually I did jump in with his friends though, but it, it was really strange. Like as if nature was letting us know who's really in charge here. Um, so to, to conclude, um, I, I really feel like there's a, there's a kind of full blown beautiful theory of bouncing that, that awaits to be fully explored. I'm trying to attract people to this. I really found it beautiful to study and there's very simple, very basic questions here. And um, it has connections to ergodicity, reachability, um, reachability analysis, um, stability, information spaces, all kinds of you know, dynamical systems that control kinds of questions mixed with computational geometry and algorithmic kinds of questions. A lot of nice things here. And I think roboticists are the right people to study these things. I think it will especially get important if we get down to like smaller scale robots in very large herds and things like this. Um, so the idea has been to let the robots behave wildly in some regime that has a minimal amount of sensing, communication, computation, and uh, control capabilities. And um, and in a case where we're also doing this weird like make small environment modifications to gently control the robots. You can always make things easier that way. I could make autonomous driving a lot easier by um, you know modifying, um, putting things in the environment that make it easier for autonomous systems. Um, give them some tape to follow or put some special signs for them. Of course, we can do a lot of things to make it easier. So I realize that we're, we're doing that, but I think that's okay in, in many um, robotics applications. So it's the robot system that we're trying to have evolve into something useful. So what parts the robot, was it the gate or the, the balls bouncing around or little vehicles rolling? I don't know, it's some kind of strange combination. I think it's important to consider that whole spectrum. 
Um, so what, what else remains in the future? Well, there's all kinds of mathematical analysis one could do of these different bouncing rule dynamics uh, in polygons and other kinds of structures and things. Um, there's also, it would be nice to make kind of tight associations between task solvability for different types of tasks and bouncing rules and environments. Um, there's also, um, you know, better algorithms needed for characterizing these dynamical system properties, finding uh, basins of attractions and doing stability analysis and ergodicity analysis and all sorts of things like this. I think there's a lot of room for improved computational tools and algorithms. And um, of course, there's all kinds of open design questions that are really interesting for making these kind of wild uh, bodies and gates um, that work together with them. Um, and there's a lot of uh, stochastic problem variations that one could look at, but I, I wanted to define this at a more general measure theoretic level, not to get too overly fancy, but just to remind you that it doesn't have to be probabilistic to do these kind of coverages and things, which I think is quite, quite interesting. Um, if you had hoped that I was going to talk about, um, well, I don't know, something really old like RRTs, um, or um, um, if you if you'd hoped that I would talk about Oculus or what it was like working in industry, um, building up some big company and um, um, all kinds of other crazy stuff or why I moved to Finland and all of that, um, you should take a look at my IROS 2020 keynote. It's on YouTube. You can just Google for my name and rapidly exploring random topics and you can find that. At one point, I'm even sitting in a Finnish sauna um, giving advice. So people told me they liked that. I don't know, but anyway, uh, feel free to look that up. Just look for me and rapidly exploring something. You should be able to find the video. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for listening. I, I very much appreciate your attendance and I hope you all stay safe and uh, healthy during this uh, pandemic. Thanks very much. I wish I could visit it in person, of course. Thank you, Steve, uh, for a very exciting and engaging talk. Uh, I will summarize, uh, uh, I, or I'll begin the discussion with a comment by uh, Rosanna Baich in the chat. Uh, for you, which says, oh hello, Steve, I love uh, your theoretical work. It is very nice to see how productive you are, very best. And I am very sure we all have similar sentiments. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much to, to Professor Bach. I'm, I'm just, I'm so honored that, that you attended my talk. I'm almost going to cry. Anyway, I really appreciate it. So, uh. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, let's begin uh, this session. Uh, so we'll take a few questions from uh, the attendees. Uh, they have been recorded in the uh, Zoom chat. And uh, um, before beginning that, I would invite uh, Arjun Nanda, who is a first year master's uh, student in robotics at GRASP, and Vasilis Vasilopoulos, who is just about to finish his PhD at GRASP uh, on reactive motion planning. Uh, guys, if you can introduce yourself in a few sentences, and then we will begin. Yeah, so um, I'm Vasilis. Very nice to see you, Steve, and, uh, and the talk was great. Um, I'm a sixth year uh, PhD student uh, working at CodeLab with Dan Kodicek. I work on reactive motion planning uh, with legged robots and applications to, uh, except for navigation, also mobile manipulation and target following, and I try to combine uh, perception techniques with uh, traditional feedback motion planning uh, for uh, uh, tasks in unknown environments. Great. Yep. Uh, my name is Arjun Nanda. Uh, I'm a first year uh, grad student in the robotics department. And uh, my interest in, I'll, you know, hoping to work on uh, perception, basically in unstructured environments, uh, basically off-roading, autonomous off-roading, uh, would be something I'd be interested to look at. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So uh, why don't we begin with a few questions from the chat? Uh, Vasilis, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Professor Vijay Kumar. Uh, can you comment on the connection to Lamelsky's bug algorithm? Um, yeah, hi, Vijay. Uh, th thanks for coming to my talk. I appreciate it. Too bad I can't sort of see everybody who is, who's in the gallery. It's a weird, like, a, it feels like, but it's not double blind. It's some kind of blind. I don't know. Um, um, how, how many people have Lomelsky? So I, it's interesting. I, I, I did some work um, um, with uh, Camila Taylor. Uh, we have a journal paper around 2014 um, um, where we, um, we, we, we made this kind of um, very minimalist bug algorithm that, that, um, that just has a, um, 
it, it can detect there's a tower emitting a, a source, some energy source, and you can just move along the gradient. In other words, in a way that increases the signal um, uh, strength. And that's your local operation you can do. And then the obstacles can be quite complex. And that one was very minimalist. And I think that the bug algorithms assume um, pretty tight control of the navigation typically. And, and, and so much so that you could reconstruct a map if you had enough memory, I, I think. So, so, so the sensing is, in some sense, it's implicit that it's a little bit strong, stronger than, than, than one might think. And so we went along the bug algorithms to some sense of minimalism there. But, I, but the, the control part, and, and I think you know, that there's some, yeah, there's some reasonable localization that's going on there with respect to the local coordinate system that you're building as you go in, in these bug algorithms. But in this particular case, you're just letting the bodies be wild and you're not really trying to estimate that. So, so there, there's much, much lower sort of burdens for the sensing and, and computation in these, in these um, um, sort of bouncing robot systems. However, maybe you might say we cheated by moving some complexity into the gates if we wanted to, depending on the task. Hope that it's a reasonable, reasonably uh, answers your question. Uh, uh, there's a question from Professor uh, Dinesh Jairam in the chat. Yeah. Uh, it seems clear that better sensing should afford better exploration, that is coverage. Uh, but is there a way to characterize the achieve, uh, achievable exploration quality in simple environments like this uh, as a function of how much information of the environment is being perceived? I don't know. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So if you just take the basic bouncing robot, it really has no information. Um, and so I'd have to start adding sort of sensor information to, to learn something about it. Um, th th there's still these problems of um, basic exploration, right? Going all the way back to, um, which, which, I, which I think Professor Baichi has worked on and many others like next best view problems where, you know, you, you can't, um, there's, the, there's the, 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 the visible part of the environment and the unknown parts. And without really having more information about which parts of the environment are more likely to have the, the treasure you're looking for or are more likely to have structure that you need to go and explore, um, it becomes very difficult to say something about it. Um, so I don't really have a good sense of like what information you can leverage to then do some kind of proofs, let's say about, um, you know, I'm doing something in a, in a, in a sort of more optimal way. If I, if I had a map of the environment and I put all that into the robot's brain, um, it's sort of like the, um, in, in, um, in cognitive science, people talk about the Cartesian theater uh, flawed hypothesis of, you know, they imagine humans have a map of the world in their brain and everything's kind of playing out perfectly with Cartesian coordinate systems and things. And if you imagine the robot has all of that, then you can just do optimal motions to anything. But if you're really in this minimalist explore mode, it becomes very difficult. Um, one, one branch of work that I've always found fascinating, but I don't know how to work it in here, but it's one thing to maybe look at are the um, competitive ratio um, analysis called competitive analysis or com in, in algorithms where you formulate a competitive ratio. One of the most basic ones is called the lost cow problem or cow path problem, where a cow is trying to find the, the, the opening in an in a, in a, in a infinitely long fence, uh, but the opening's somewhere to the left or to the right, and it has to move back and forth in some zigzag pattern to be optimal. And what does optimal mean there? It means comparing the total amount that the cow would travel in the worst case, because it doesn't know which way to go, versus just going directly there because you knew where it was at. So you may be able to do some kind of competitive analysis for these kinds of problems, but um, it would get pretty hard pretty fast. So, yeah. I, I, I can't really fully answer that question because I think it, it's, it's interesting, but it's um, that's the kind of question that takes years to answer, I would say. It, it's, um, to follow up on that, uh, how would we understand minimalism in sensing? Isn't uh, more data always better? Um, I think it's very important to understand what data, what information you need for the task at hand. So um, if, you're, if you're not sure about your task or you're not sure about the family of tasks you might be able to, you might be asked to, to deliver, then I would say that that would tend to drive the information requirements artificially high, because you're not sure what you're gonna be doing. So you might as well go and build and measure everything. And I, I like to think that um, um, to, to, to me, it's better to, um, to only sense what you need, be very judicious about that because you may go and maybe sensors are cheap and you, you have a huge amount of data that you've moved from the outside world into the, 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 the computer. And then you have to do all these, you have to run all these expensive computations inside the computer when in some sense, you could have let nature do those computations for you. It may be that you just wanted to extract one simple thing from the world and you could have built it with a very simple detector rather than build a sensor that measures everything. And then you have like a Cartesian theater inside of the robot and it has to search through all of this stuff to find the information. So if you just leave it outside, I, I, I think it's, 
it's very close to the way Rodney Brooks was thinking of a very long time going back to the 80s. Um, what is it? Something like the, the if I can't get the quote right, but something like the world is its own best model. Um, I wouldn't go to some of the extremes that, that maybe Rodney Brooks did in those days, but, um, but, but I believe in minimalist models, like only build what you kind of need to, to extract re and, and extract reliably in order to solve your task. Interestingly, when I was in industry, the same thing was true for the Oculus Rift. Um, if you're going to make a consumer product, especially one that you wear on your face, you want it to be lightweight, low energy consuming. You don't want a bunch of extra sensors that you don't need. You don't want to just put a whole bunch of data in and then sift through it all to find those critical things. You want to try to determine what that is in advance. So what I found in my life was kind of interesting. When I liked more theoretical things, I had a, a, a sense towards minimalism. When I liked developing a consumer product, it was back towards minimalism again. And then a lot of times in academia, it seems like we're in the middle of, let's do something big and complicated and crazy with big amounts of data and big amounts of sensors and grand and glorious like that. When at the two extremes of extreme theory and extreme uh, consumer product making, um, it was minimalism, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so there is another question from Professor CJ Taylor in the chat. Yeah. Uh, great oh, great. Hi, hi, CJ. Great. So I should uh, say hi to everyone, but the people I've known since the 90s, I guess I say an extra hi to, so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so great talk, Steve. I was wondering if some of these ideas can be generalized to configuration spaces with higher dimensionality. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I, I, I was, for a while, and it happened like right as I was about to get into Oculus, I was working on a book about RRTs and I was trying to figure out what the difference is between exploration using a, a robot to actually move and then search in like a motion planning algorithm. And, and the thing in a motion planning algorithm is that you can jump from place to place for free. And if you're searching with a physical robot, you have to actually move the robot there. And so it's interesting, the robot, if it has the configuration space model in its brain and, and it does computations over it, it can jump around from place to place, imagining what would happen if it did move to those places, right? So, so, so you, you could get these kind of behaviors. So that makes you wonder then, um, you know, we, we, we've certainly thought about random bounce walking in sampling based motion planning before. And um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be random. I would just say the problems get really hard really fast, but um, I think long walks with bounces does tend to perform better than just um, more Brownian like motions for exploring spaces. But, um, but I, I think it's fairly wide open problem if you wanted to make, you know, in the old days, going back to say the late eighties or early nineties, people were using randomized potential field methods and okay, you get stuck in local minima and you want to get your way out of it. So this might be a reasonable way to get your way out of minima perhaps. Um, but I think because you can jump around from place to place for free, that's why I thought something like a rapidly exploring random tree was better because you can just kind of jump from place to place as you explore. But for a 3D exploration problem, maybe you're bouncing around inside of a, a water tank um, and you can change your, your elevation as well. That, that There might be something interesting to do in there. So uh, another question from Professor Dan Kodicek. Uh, how would these systems? Oh yeah, great. Right. Hey Dan, cool. Uh, how would there's how would these systems and their analysis change in the work if the workspace were not latent? What's the role of the underlying topology? Okay. Oh, that's great, Dan. Yeah, that's that's good. So let's um, let's be on some Kirby space and 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 uh, maybe we just go along geodesics or something, um, perhaps. And I, I guess as long as long as as long as you can, you know, they, they become, you know, you can you can replace the straight lines with whatever the geodesics are for some some space that you find yourself living in. Um, I guess that's okay. I, I don't mind as long as you can have this description of iterated map dynamics, and you can talk about what happens when you go from boundary to boundary. You can start making some then very simple, um, you know, if you can then make some very simple boundary interaction laws, then I guess it all looks pretty and fine. Um, but I don't know if anything I've studied would, would, would contribute to that. It maybe, you know, starts to get quite, quite complicated um, sort of on its own. But I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't do the same kinds of things. The important thing to keep in mind is this Poincaré map type mentality that your region of interest, like let's say the boundary, if you want it to be wild, then maybe, you know, you know maybe the, the, the you know, uh, Dan Kodacek's version is you're in some kind of curvy blobby sort of space and, and you're maybe moving along the, if you want to keep striking the surface of that, um, and, or maybe it's this curvy surface is the thing you're moving on perhaps and there's a boundary on that, that's fine. But, um, but you want to then be able to describe this kind of, you know, um, um, 
mappings so that when you iterate them, let's say no open set is left behind on that. And, and then, and then I, you know, conceptually, it's not hard to do, but I guess the devil's in the details like with most things. Okay, uh, the next question is from Professor Manfred Murari. Um, what are your recommendations for uh, ro robotic lo uh, lawn mowers? Um, well, I would take robotic lawn mowers and maybe put them in ro with robotic vacuum cleaners, which, um, and then, um, you know, we noticed that the earliest Roombas seemed to do almost like these weasel wall kinds of motions, except they had something really clever, which, which also pertains to lawn mowers, which is, um, you know, it's very easy to do wall following, right? With very simple sensor, even little mechanical things, little mechanical wall following mice have almost nothing in them in terms of circuitry. So, um, but, but the um, using the dirt sensor, which was very clever is um, if there's a region of dirt, it did wall following on the dirt, but it's destructive, right? Because it sucks up the dirt. And so it becomes a spiraling pattern that eats the dirt, which I thought was really clever, right? So it's one of the things we, we did a lot of times kind of studying the early Roombas. So it looked like it was mostly doing, I would say these weasel ball type motions. And then when it found a patch of dirt, it would do this kind of wall following. Pretty good. I've noticed that the, the modern um, um, vacuum cleaning robots that we have, we have a nice neato ones that we use in our apartments here. Um, they, they're doing full slam and they show it to you on your phone, right? So they decided that it was, they, they could afford maybe better sensors and they just go and build a map and that worked out pretty well. So I would say <coughs> for cutting your grass, if you can build a map and it's still a cheap enough consumer product with the sensors that you have, sure, why not do it? Because then you can do these systematic back and forth motions, which I would guess would burn a lot less energy, especially if your lawnmower is gasoline powered. But I guess those things are probably electric powered if it's a robotic lawnmower, I would think. So I don't, I don't think mixing gasoline and computers in close range is not too smart. Perhaps. Well, okay, cars do it, but, but anyway, I wouldn't probably put it in a small consumer product. Um, so yeah, interesting question. But I think um, it's funny how the vacuum cleaners have gone from these kind of bouncing looking like things plus dirt following boundary to full blown slam. And I, I, I would say for, for Ron Moore's, I, I would expect if you can build a map, go and do it. If you can't, then yeah, maybe you have to resort to something like this plus some this, this destructive boundary following kind of strategy. Yep. Uh, so the next question is from Professor Costa Stanilis. Um, oh, hey, Costa. If, I, if I understand correctly, the robot's location is perceived from bird's eye view. Uh, in e is egocentric perception qualitative, qualitatively different? Uh, perceiving bearings, for example, to other robots? Yeah, well, none of these robots are perceiving much, right? So it's it, the only sensing we really put in these systems. Okay, I got to be really careful now. Some of the systems had nothing, right? They were just weasel balls with pieces of paper. So there's no perspective on anything. Um, if I were to put a camera inside of one of the weasel balls, actually, we put an IMU in one of them once, but it was such a mess because the vibrations and everything was, it was kind of horrific. And the dynamics, it behaves different mechanically as soon as you start putting stuff inside of it. Okay, no surprise for roboticists, maybe we should have known better. But um, th then we put simple sensors on the gates, right? So what's the perspective there? I, I guess it's the gates perspective or the robot maybe in the case of the, um, where we put a simple bumper sensor on it so that it knows that it made contact. The, the perspective is you hit a wall, you hit a wall, you hit a wall. That's about all you have really. Maybe you have a little bit more because you know which way to turn. So you may have enough to, to, to know the, 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 um, the angle between your incoming trajectory and, and, and the wall normal or something like that, or tangent, whatever you like. So you have a little bit of information, but that's all the perspective is. My pictures are the, sort of a bird's eye view, that's true. But from the robot's perspective, it doesn't have much other than just whatever it minimally needs to interact with the wall or whatever the gate needs to change its internal mode. Um, so the next question is from Arnav Lamija. Uh, what applications are you thinking of for bouncing robots? Um, I don't know. I, I just think uh, really small stuff where, where, you, where, where, you, where you can't get away with putting a lot of um, sensors on board, a lot of computation on board, and maybe actuation is sort of limited. So I would say small swarms of robots inside of a fluid doing hopefully something useful. I, I wouldn't say I'm like ready to launch a consumer product with these kinds of things or anything like that. But um, I, I like also to study these because I think they're quite uh, thought provoking and they help challenge us to understand what a robot is, what's the environment, what's a robot system, and how can we do things differently when um, we, we don't necessarily have to do it in that um, traditional way that we all learned that was in my first slide, my first sort of real slide, which, which um, 
talked about you know doing SLAM and and maybe um, ha uh, calculating emotion plans and doing feedback control and all of that stuff. So um, so I wanted to kind of go to the ludicrous extremes and show that you can do something interesting because in some regimes I think you'll find yourself there. But um, but I feel like that's not my burden to find. But 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 I, but I, I feel most motivated by these uh, really small scale robots, maybe at a MEMS or NEMS level. Great. So I guess as a follow up to that, have you considered possible applications to other traditional motion planning problems, such as target convergence instead of patrolling or uh, exploration? Um, well, it, it's it's hard. You, target convergence. Well, you, you can hit a particular place, you'll be guaranteed to. And if you want to make a sensor that tells you whether or not you've hit the treasure, let's say, let's say your goal is to find the treasure, um, then these these robots will go around and find the treasure. And it converges in that sense. It won't be the nice kind of control theory looking convergence or stability that we all like, where it kind of wiggles and then kind of gradually smooths out and you know stabilizes and, and you know, asymptotically converges nicely. It'll just go wham and hit the um, hit the place where it's supposed to be, um, and and it will be let's say guaranteed to do that uh, in in the theoretical part, and and it will be, I would say very very likely to do that in practice for these kind of things we build. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, if you could move on to a little bit of AI, uh, VR, uh, what are the most difficult aspects of VR according to your perspective? And uh, can you use, for example, uh, some sort of machine learning techniques to get uh, to understand uh, physiological parameters? And can for you VR. elaborate? Yeah, for VR. Yeah, okay. Sure, yeah, um, um, fair game. Let's see, um, I know something about VR, I guess. So, so, so let's see here. Um, um, well, um, I would say one of the biggest challenges right now, okay, there's a lot of different ways to look at that because, um, and I've been hanging around with a lot of industry people. Most of my experience on VR has been on the industry side, especially consumer products and stuff. I was also a vice president at Huawei for a while. Um, um, and, and I was their chief scientist of um, VR, augmented reality, mixed reality, whatever all those realities are supposed to be. I guess they're X realities now and stuff. It doesn't really matter to me. I, I'm as happy with VR, but, but um, um, but, but, but there's, I would say the biggest challenge, aside from global cooperation, because it, it takes quite a bit of effort to, um, and expertise to pull all these pieces together. You can't just sort of program your way out of the problems that, that, that are faced by VR, um, especially because the human component is very strong and there's certainly sickness and fatigue issues that have to be addressed. One of the biggest challenges is the next generation of displays. We're kind of, you know, Oculus got really far because you could put smartphone screens in front of your eyes and, and take the IMUs in here that are dirt cheap MEMS elements and re we recalibrate them to make them work a little better and then I kind of repurpose them and then you can get everything to work. But the next hurdle is to take things that are not yet consumer devices and put them together and make them work really well. And so um, there's been a lot of progress in waveguides and, um, and, and laser MEMS combinations and, and other kinds of sort of small projectors and things that make this kind of idea of putting glasses on, lightweight glasses, um, really feasible. And then that's gonna come within a couple of years, really this time, and it's really gonna come, whether or not the market will pick up all of those things and, and it will turn into full-blown consumer product success that everyone wants to buy, I don't really know. But that's where things are challenging now. They're just these big bulky devices and um, there will be these glasses-like things, but if they become glasses like this, it's not gonna be so much a VR experience and maybe smaller amounts of things or narrower fields of view. You can cover it up to block outside light and still get some VR experience, but, but, but you'll see a wave of those things coming next. So, so that, that's some kind of challenge, I would say. Um, understanding how the human and the, or any organism that uses VR kind of mingles with that is very, very challenging to understand. That's something we've been investigating a lot. I call it perception engineering. The, 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 the object that's been being engineered here, it might be tempting to say you're engineering the headset, but what you're actually engineering is a perceptual experience. And that more lives in the organism. And, 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 and you have to understand then the organism's response together with the device. And the devices are just technological artifacts of the day somehow. But really you're, you're trying to somehow manipulate the human perceptual systems and the rest of the human physiology into, into, into you know, some sort of targeted behavior. And so I think there's this whole growing field that but should be around that it looks very interdisciplinary now because it involves perceptual psychology and neuroscience and, many other things, but I think there's room for this thing to be just one field, perception engineering. You're engineering a perceptual experience. And 
how do we how do we describe that even in an idealized mathematical setting? Which I also find fascinating to to figure out then what would it mean in robotics to have virtual reality? What's virtual reality for a robot? In that case, you can fool its sensors and you can make a full on sort of VR experience for a robot that would be analogous to like the brain in a vat, the human brain in a vat, which is um. Uh, something that kind of looks impossible, let's say, or, or certainly not with any technology we have today, hopefully. But, um, but you can do those kind of experiments with robots. So one of the things I want to do is unify this notion of virtual reality uh, or perception engineering in a way that works with engineered devices as well as biological organisms. And then there's a lot of concepts from neuroscience that come into play with that. Um, things like Friston's free energy principle or predictive coding. Um, 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 and and uh, just a lot of interesting sort of connections that I think can go on both sides of the fence, the engineering side and the neuroscience side. So, so we're working to try to understand these things very deeply. And I think that's where a lot of the sort of fascinating challenges are. Um, does AI fit in there? Yeah, you, you, could, you could use machine learning to, um, uh, to try to predict whether or not some experience might make someone sick. Um, I could just look at the optical flows of a, of a video stream from a user. And I, I would bet one could make pretty good predictions on whether or not they were having a good time or even whether it's likely to trigger um, uh, the, the onset of some of the adverse symptoms uh, because of something called vection, which is the illusion of um, the illusion of motion that's due to certain optical flows. If you've ever been stationary in a train and then another train next to you starts moving, you might feel like you go backwards or something. It's like those kinds of things getting triggered over and over and over again. And so it's not too hard to look at a video stream and determine what that's, that, that's going to happen. Um, that goes back to... Um, um, problems with photoepileptic seizures in uh, video streams. Um, they've built these things called flash pattern analyzers to, to where you feed in a, a video stream to get it approved for broadcasting. There was a Pokemon episode in the 1990s in Japan that a lot of kids had seizures from, uh, photoepileptic seizures. Not everyone, but a enough that they had to now check for frequencies of flickering patterns and things like that. So there's a long history of, I would say, using um, um, statistical pattern recognition kinds of techniques to, to predict whether or not some stimuli in a, in a, in a media setting, and, and which, which would then extend naturally to virtual reality. So, so to, certainly that would be an area where, where a lot could be done. That's a long answer. Hopefully that it covered this. It's a different topic. I thought I would fill in a little more. Um, there is a question from Professor Michael Boza in the chat. Uh, okay. Thanks for the great talk. How should we think about bridging the gap between the simple ideal representation of the bouncing ball robot and non ergodic reality? And should we aim to build and control robots to act more ergodic or find ways to relax the theory to include more permissive models? I don't know. It's the gap between what and what? Uh, should we try to bridge the gap between the simple ideal representation of the bouncing ball robot and non ergodic reality? Non-ergodic reality. I don't know what that is. Uh, um, yeah. I, I, can, can I get some clarification of that maybe? Is this by typing or how, how are you getting these in? Um, I, I think, I mean, okay, this is some kind of maybe theory and some robots doing some cute things. And, and, and so, um, you know, is this going to help me solve autonomous driving? Um, you know, probably not anytime soon. So, so, so that would be, and we probably don't want ergodic cars out there bouncing around. So, um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what the what the gap is. I guess if the gap's a little more defined, I, I might be able to to have to have some some sense there. Oh, I see Michael popping in. Oh, thanks for doing that. That's cool. Hi, Steve. Hello. Th thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, just trying to trying to ask sort of the real robot, right? Is not going to behave in this ideal setting, um, particularly with respect to their ergodicity uh, uh, restriction, right? I mean, there's going to be friction. There's going to be sort of variations of the impact losses. There's going to be um, you know, all sorts of other unmodeled dynamical effects. And I guess sort of one of the, the question is like this theory sort of derives from the beautiful simplicity of, you know, of the, of the model that you've, you've created. And I'm, and I'm wondering sort of how we get between there and, and, you know, our, our real multi-degree freedom robot, right? which. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see what you mean. Well, what's really strange to me is these, these weasel balls, which I always keep one around, you know, for, for, I mean, it's, 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 it's really amazing to me. That, that this you know very simple mechanism, which you know it's not doing much there, just just spinning around, um, has has you know such incredibly good behavior. It was always doing whatever the ergodic theory said it should be doing. Okay, we weren't looking at the the measure or volume of certain or area of certain regions of the floor and calculating whether it revisited those 
you know, with the same frequency as any other region. But this thing has such good exploration properties by itself, and it's very practical, and it's slipping and doing all kinds of crazy stuff because I don't care about the predictability of it. I just need it to hit every open set. Weaker than ergodic, I just need it to hit everywhere. And we never found any cases where it would not escape. It just would always escape. Oh, oh, no, there was the one weird day. Okay. There was one case where we put it on an air hockey table and it had a thin rim around the table. And it found some weird way to just slip around the rim forever and never kind of bounce. It was a beautiful kind of dance it did with the rim. But otherwise, you know, kind of normalist looking environments where it can't slip with some really low ridge or something. It was going around beautifully. So, so I would argue that um, there's all kinds of practical things that will behave that way. Maybe most things you encounter in your everyday robotics life do not. My robot arm probably doesn't behave like that and it's designed not to behave like that. An autonomous vehicle probably doesn't. So, so, um, so maybe it's just a, maybe we just have different ways of, 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 of thinking about it. I, 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 I would have loved to have a, a, a robot that was like the perfect ergodic maybe bounce or something, but we, we also started looking at, um, which I maybe didn't mention in too much detail, but in the, in the wafer work, which, be, which then went to IGRR recently, um, we were saying the, the external bouncing angle when it, when it bounces could be within some range. And then, so we allow a lot of slop. So we're considering uncertainty in that and still trying to figure out what kind of simple bouncing rules would lead to um, a desirable behavior. So it doesn't have to be the pure full-blown Bunimovich stadium you know, behavior or something. There's a lot of cases where we allow the, the strategy to vary a lot. We can use bits of information feedback to keep it on track, so to speak. And, um, and, and you know, we, we don't, there, there will always be some divergence between kind of what the theory says and what the practice is. But, but what we found is that the practical part of it, the important part of it, I should say, um, like it always seems to escape was kind of easy to achieve. We spent so much time trying to constrain our robots to stay in one place where we want them and then go to some other very prescribed place with coordinates and all of that, it's so much easier to just let them slop around and they tend to hit everything pretty easily. At least that was our experience. So it was like maybe counterintuitive, but that was kind of the feeling. Maybe it's not the answer you're looking for. I'm sorry, but that's how I sort of felt from our perspective. Uh, I would actually like to extrapolate on Michael's question. So uh, uh, to, uh, th this is perhaps a, a very drastic example, but uh, if someone takes a machine learning class today, they train a model, they put it on the cloud and other people can use this model, no sweat. Uh, if someone builds a robot today, they themselves could would find it difficult to run the same robot two months from now. So there is a pretty big gap between what we do in the lab and what we would like to do in robotics. And you've always been someone who has worked on foundations of robotics. How do you envision a theory of robotics looking? Or what would you do if uh, to be able to translate these experiments that we do in the lab uh, very quickly to actual applications. Um, experiments, so those are two different kinds of transitions though, right, I guess, because there, there's a transition from, well, I don't know if it's a transition so much, but there's, let's say, a, a kind of dance between theory and practice, right? They, they both kind of inform each other, right? And, um, you know, a, a theory is not so good if it doesn't let you predict anything, right? Or, 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 or even it hopefully provides a deep understanding of your problem and it allows you to to, to predict some behavior or explain some behavior. And it's very nice to do that. If you're going from the robots in the lab to robots um, making making money maybe, or, or like being some kind of successful product. Or, or um, just running without uh, babysitting them. Oh God, yeah, that's, that's um, um, you know, it's interesting. It, well, one of the things I learned in the investment world is right after Oculus, um, after this big success, you know, Facebook paid three billion for the for the company, so it was kind of let's just say that generated a lot of attention, and then people thought maybe I, I'm like a lucky horseshoe or something. You know, I don't know. A lot of investors started approaching me and um, university people and everything. And yeah, I'm, people in robotics know that I'd be the least likely person to probably do something like that, which I thought it was fun to do something absurd and try it. But but um, um, so, so so it was it was it was re really interesting that that. Um, um, that, that, that these that these kind of um, um, what do I want to say this, this kind of transition to a, to a consumer product like this um, I, I don't know it, it, it's it's um, it, it, it works in that setting because um, we were able to kind of reshuffle smartphone components and and it already I would say would be the kind of thing that most investors would say oh that's very risky stay away from that stay away from hardware that's what they all say and now if you want to go to another extreme which is have the thing be autonomous and roll itself around, you know. So, so there's there's no mechanical parts, you know, in a, in the, say the Oculus Rift headset, 
you know, moving, moving about and such, unless you consider MEMS element vibrations or something, but let's not consider that. So um, th then it's like doubly bad hardware, you know, if you want to make some kind of product that, that, that actually has mechanical elements to it. Chinese investors are probably more aggressive with regard to that. Certainly Silicon Valley investors, okay, they, they've, they've grown some in that. Most parts of the world, they don't want to touch that because it's just, it's extremely hard to make profitable robotics products. And maybe that's largely because so many things can go wrong. Um, but it's also very hard to find the right use cases. I think vacuum cleaning has been a, been a, a moderate, but pretty good success. Um, that's been wonderful to see. What happens to robotics a lot is once it becomes successful, they don't call it a robot anymore or right, something. So I don't know, but um, um, I, I know, I'm pretty sure Rodney Brooks said that when he was starting iRobot that they, before that, maybe they couldn't call it, for a while they couldn't call it a robot, I think. But um, it sounds like a robot, I robot. But anyway, I think at some point they were saying they didn't want to call it a robot because um, that was known to investors as a, Kiss of death, you know. You know that's 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 a money sink, not a not a money source. You know? So so it's just been that way. I don't think it's the fault of roboticists. It's just extremely challenging to make reliable products that, you know, again with battery considerations and breakability and durability and all these kinds of things. If it's a smaller consumer product, maybe it can be a cat toy or something like that that gets broken easily and and uh, you know people don't want to pay the money for it. On and on and on, a lot of problems. Much easier to have some app. That you know everybody wants and to do that social does not things interact that, with blah, the physical blah, 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 blah. much more likely to work reliably. The reason why is because there's already an infrastructure that supports that. You know, when you manufacture a physical thing, uh, some kind of hardware, you, there's a whole manufacturing process. And if it's something that's never been done before, it's ridiculously complicated. Manufacturing in a software setting is the copy command, right? You just you make as many copies as you want. It's easy. So, so a lot of these kind of problems from hardware go away. In the, in the software settings. So anyway, that's one of the, uh, that's a long conversation. So uh, thank you for uh, a very illuminating discussion and a very exciting talk. Uh, uh, we are all very glad to hear from you and join, uh, join us here. Uh, I will let Gabriela take it from here. Okay. okay well, well, what a wonderful talk that was, a very nice uh, Q&A panel. Um, thank you everyone for joining us um, today. Uh, please tune in next Friday, Ooh. next Friday, January, uh, February 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next Grass Robotics speaker, Dr. Emmanuel Collins from the University of Louisville. For more information on these and the upcoming events, please be sure to follow us on social media and check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day, everyone. <laughs>